Collins and Spencer. We were very lucky to have her come out to California for this interview, so let's not waste any more time. Let's bring her out. Wow, this is quite the set you all have. I almost got lost coming up here. <laughs> Thank you for having me on here. It really is an honor. The pleasure is all ours. Now before we get into the nitty gritty, please tell us more about yourself. Well, I was born in Henry County, Virginia in 1882 to parents of mixed race. What with, if you don't really mind me asking? No, it's quite alright because you see, my father was black, white, and Seminole, and my mother was black and white. Both of them were slaves, but my mother was illegitimate due to the fact that her father was wealthy, but her mother was a slave just like how she was. Now, was it hard growing up of mixed lineage? Instead of using the term growing up mixed, I prefer the term growing up black. Even though I am of mixed race, I always was perceived as black from myself and from others around me. Growing up in this time was one of the most challenging eras. See. The constant act of segregation was inflicted upon those of color, and the violence was just heartaching. Looking at the photographs we have of you, some people might mistake you as a different race. How do you feel about that? Actually, yes, that is very true. But then again, if you were light, like how I am, you would look a thousand times lighter in the cameras they used way back then. <laughs> Did you move often as a child? Yes, actually, I moved a couple of times. The first was to Martinsville right after I was born, and then to Bramwell, and then Lynchburg, West Virginia with my mother right after her and my father separated. Now, you don't have to answer this, but how did you deal with the divorce? There's nothing for me to say, really. I was too young when all of that went down, and I knew my mother wasn't in the right state to take care of me, so I stayed with the Dixie family in foster care. How about your academic state? As a poet, I'm pretty sure you must have had some level of degree in education. I was actually enrolled into Virginia Theological and Seminary College at the age of 11, and I stayed there for about a good six years, and while I was receiving my education there, I met my husband, Edward. I love you, baby! <laughs> Absolutely fascinating. We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to open up a panel on Twitter, and for all of you who have questions, go ahead and uh, tweet it at Harlem Talk. We'll be right back. This is her story, her legacy, and her impact. And Spencer. Now we have Mrs. Adrienne Chen, who is going to read the questions off of Twitter for us. Hello everyone, I will be reading all of the Twitter questions. So, at Mahogany M asked, many people have their own definition of what the Harlem Renaissance was. What is your definition of it? Well, as most of us know, the Harlem Renaissance was a rise of African American talent, a combustion of artistic culture, depicted in music, art, poetry, and literature. For me personally, it wasn't just a literary movement, but more of a movement towards equal rights. Nice! Next question! At Ariana Wilkins asks, what was your life like after getting married and having children? For the most part, life was pretty neutral. In 1924, I worked at Dunbar High School Library as a board of trustees. I spent most of my free time just writing poems and helping the community settle on improving African American lives. Eventually, I worked on a campaign for the NAACP to help hire black teachers and get them into black schools. Now, at Alexis and underscore Janae asks, describe what your, what your literary career was like. My first literary career kicked off when I first met James Walden Johnson back in 1919. I've had acquaintances that have tried to help me publish my poems before, but I just wasn't really that interested in their methods. And when it came to James, I had a special connection with him. So 
Basically, I was often more protective over my poems and my works rather than myself. And my poems often showed my frustration towards the society at that time. Actually, Which one of the poems do you think expressed that the most? It would definitely have to be um, White Things. Let's open up the panel to the audience. Ma'am, come ask. So I was wondering what your intentions were when you made the Garden of Eden poem. So basically the point of the garden was to serve as a refuge for other Harlem artists such as Langston Hughes and Gwendolyn Brooks. Due to the Jim Crow laws, African Americans weren't allowed in most hotels, so the garden was basically our sanctuary. With that, it ends our question panel for our viewers. We are going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Most things are colorful things, the sky, earth, and sea. Black men are most men, but the white are free. White things are rare things, so rare, so rare. They stole from out silvered world somewhere. Fighting earth plains, fair plains, save greenly grassed. They strewed white feathers of cowards' dents as they passed. The golden stars with lance finds, the hills all red and darkened pined. They blanched with their wand of power and turned the blood in a ruby rose to a power white poppy flower. They pried a race of black, black men and burned them to ashes white. Then laughing, a young one claimed a skull. For the skull of a black is white, not dull, but a glistening, awful thing. Made it seems for this ghoul to swing in the face of God with all his might and swear by hell that sired him, man-maker, make white. We are done with our panel of questions, we are coming to our close. Now that we've finished our discussion, we'd like to give Anne this. Anne, please take this basket as a gift from us to you for your contribution into the Harlem Renaissance. Thank you for giving our fellow brethren and sisters a refugee. Thank you so much for this gift and thanks everyone for watching. Now a gift to the audience. If you look under your seat, you each get a yam.